Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. This message is entitled, The God Who Makes Iron Swim. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity that we can come together to hear your word. And Father, as this word is preached today, we ask that it would not be my words, but your words, and that hearts may be touched through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Second Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 1. We're going to spend the majority of our time together there. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 6 and, and verse 1. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. The Bible shows us that Elisha seems to be the headmaster of the school of the prophets. He had taken up the mantle of Elijah. And now he finds himself a spiritual leader in Israel. Elisha, once mentored by Elijah, seems to be the head mentor of the sons of the prophets. Now, these were the spiritual leaders in Israel. Even though these men had unique relationships with God, they still seem to have benefited from a relationship in which they could gain from the experience of one who had their gift. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church to empower the church and to catapult it into service. But even with these spiritual gifts, God uses people as he used Elisha who have had an experience with him to guide and to instruct those who will be enlisted in his service. That's why we have elders. That's why we have pastors. And that's why we have the spirit of prophecy. Many people today have a lot of negative things to say about organized religion. There's a lot of negativity about the validity of the church. But God still has an organized body through which he works, as he did in the time of Elisha. You see, even though the sons of the prophets might have had some of the gifts of the spirit, the Bible shows us that God still had a man in place who had the experience with these gifts. One who could train them. One who could guide them. One whose experiences could help them to avoid the pitfalls. Sometimes some of us think that we know things and we don't have a clue. And even though God may be blessing our ministry and, and blessing our work, and that doesn't mean that we don't still have much to learn. A lot of people go around saying, the Lord has taught me this, or God has taught me that, and the Lord has been showing me. And if there were, and if there were any more things for them to learn, then they assure themselves that God himself would teach them. But such people lack the spirit of wisdom and humility. Because more often than not, they act in accordance with their own will, with their own heart, and not God's will. They follow their own self-directed path rather than the path of the Spirit. You see, God uses human agencies to instruct and to guide his people. This may be because other people, people who thought like us, people who have had the same experience as us, people who have walked the path that we walk or felt the way that we feel, ask the same questions that we might have asked often make the best tools of instruction for the plans that God has for us. God doesn't just teach you theory. The Bible is not just a textbook. It's an anthology of testimonies of people who were once in your situation. 
who thought the way that you think, who walked the path that you walk, who felt the way that you feel, until God stepped in and did a work of transformation, and now that man or that woman of God's experience can inform your experience. So that you don't have to make the same mistakes. You don't have to stumble at the same stumbling block. You, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Because God puts it in someone's path with a testimony. God will give you someone with a testimony to inform your experience. Elisha had much to teach these young men before it was time to pick up the mantle of leadership. God wanted to catapult these men into service. But first, he had to mold them. First, he had to shape them. First, he had to prepare them for the mission that he had in store for them. You see, a lot of times in the church, we stand in awe of people. Sometimes we stand in awe of the preacher. Sometimes we stand in awe of the singer. And sometimes you get some people who hold certain positions in the church. And they hold on to these positions for so long that people think that nobody else can do that job except for them. Or that somebody else can do it, but just not as good. Yet, this was not the case with Elisha and his ministry. And it's not to be the case in the church today. God's purpose in the school of the prophets was not for the sons of the prophets to be in awe of God's prophet. The school of the prophets was for the purpose of producing, inspiring, and empowering more prophets. This is a lesson to us today that sometimes we get so caught up in the messenger that we forget that we too are carriers of the message. The Bible tells us the story of two men prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, who, who was zealous for Moses, protested, Moses, forbid them. You're the prophet. You're the one we follow. How dare these men speak in the name of God? They're not you, Moses. And Moses responds in Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 29. Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, the Bible says, And, and Moses said unto him, Enviest thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit in them. You see, God wants to put his spirit in us. And sometimes we get so caught up in titles, and then we get caught up in positions, and we get so caught up in people that we forget that God wants to put his spirit in us. It's not about the messenger. It never was. It's about the message. And God's end time church of Bible prophecy has a message. A three angels message. And some of us need to stop making church about us. And start remembering that it is about God. Some of us have been given unique talents that God wants to use. And not to hold the church hostage. But to empower the people. It, it, it takes a level of spiritual maturity to realize that the church is and always has been bigger than you. Elisha's mission wasn't about him, nor was Moses' mission about him. Moses understood that if God could get through to his people, every one of them would have been a Moses. Moses wasn't an exception to the rule. Moses was an example of the rule. And in Elisha's time, Elisha was the example to the people. Does God still have examples in the church today? Is there somebody this morning that wants to be made an example? You see, a lot of times people like to complain. And they say the church this or, or, or the church that and, and they're not doing enough of this or they're doing too much of that. And a lot of times we forget that we are the church. And the church is what we make it. So you're not supposed to criticize the church. You're supposed to be empowered to be the next example. 
So if something needs to get done, go do it. You see, the church is not a building. The church is a called out people. Some of us need to realize that we are called out to minister. Every single member of God's end time church is called to minister. Now what form that ministry takes is between you and God. But we are all called to service. God is telling somebody this morning that he can unlock your potential. And some of us need to stop waiting around and be the next example. All of you. All of you have potential. God knows that what, what, what God knows what he can do in every one of you, even when we don't see the potential in ourselves. God wants to transform and to empower us so bad that we have to fight him and resist the Holy Spirit not to be transformed and empowered. Is, is there somebody that needs to surrender this morning? Does God have a, a people in this particular church that are ready to minister and grow this church? Amen. Does God have a people called out to be examples in Babylon? Mm -hmm. When the people began to see how God was working through Elisha, the school of the prophets became so enlarged that the sons of the prophet needed to, needed to build a new dorm room. They, they requested that Elisha allow them to go to the Jordan and to obtain some beams of wood from the trees and to, and to build a much larger accommodation. Elisha consented and it was requested that he also go with them. And as the project was underway, it seems that some of the tools used to chop down the trees were borrowed from others who were more wealthy. Now, some commentators suggest that this might have been because the Philistines monopolized the use of iron and, in order, and, and they did this in order to weaken Israel's military. So this would have made the tools, like, like an iron axe that would be used to chop down trees, a whole lot more expensive and unaffordable. So it's no wonder that the sons of the prophets may have had to borrow certain tools that were not affordable. Now as this work was underway, the story comes to a climax. 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 5. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 5, the Bible says, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now, given the expensive cost attached to such a tool during a time when iron was so expensive, we can understand this young man's situation. Where would he get the money to replace such an expensive tool? He was distressed. He was in a tough spot. He cried out for Elisha. We all face times of discouragement, times of perplexity and hardship, and there are those who look for encouragement. But this was the son of a prophet. He was the son of the encourager. He was in the school of encouragement. So what happens when the encourager gets discouraged? Sometimes we look to our pastors and elders for leadership. And when the encourager gets discouraged, what then happens to the people? How do they stay encouraged? It may be for this reason that God had to inspire faith in this young would-be prophet. God had to teach the young man some things through Elisha so that in the future, when he faced the difficulties of his ministry, as the devil put obstacles in his path, he would have an experience to fall back on in times of discouragement and adversity. Sometimes situations make us feel hopeless. Sometimes we feel powerless to solve our problems. There are times when the answers don't seem readily available. There are times when discouragement sets in and because we don't see a way out. There are moments when solutions are not apparent, but God does not abandon his people. You see, the iron axe was at the bottom of the river. 
Now, logic tells us that when iron sinks, it does not come back up. And, and, and so for this preacher's kid, the situation looked hopeless. And for some of us, when we don't see a way out, things look hopeless. Sometimes situations happen and things don't look good. There are times when life takes unexpected turns. You get laid off, you get turned down, and, and your car doesn't make the right turn at the right time, and so you're in trouble. And when you don't make God the center of your life, there's nothing and no one you can turn to. That's right. So when God is not in your situation, your problem may hold you down like a dead weight sinking to the bottom of the river. If, it, if, if God is an it, you remain shackled by your burdens that you may carry and restricted to the confines of your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Somebody this morning is facing some problems and they need God to release them from their captivity. Mm -hmm. Somebody is trapped in a lifestyle of sin and lawlessness and you know that that's not where you need to be. But you're still allowing sin to pin you down and drown you in the river of your circumstances. Be like the son of the prophet who called out for help, who realized that his situation was bigger than him, who recognized that he needed help outside of himself, who cried out, alas, I'm in trouble. I'm in a situation that I can't fix. I'm in some water that's over my head, and I need some deliverance. I need God to step in to my situation. The son of the prophet had cried out, his borrowed iron axe head was now on the floor of the river. Going to verse 6. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. The iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to me, and he put it out his hand and took it. I'm here to let you know this morning that I serve a God that makes iron swim. And if God can make iron swim, then that means that the weights of my burdens, and the weights of my past mistakes, and the weights of my sins, and the weights of my circumstances can't keep me down because Jesus was lifted up and the cross allows me to swim in the river of my circumstances. For some of us, it's not until we have encountered an experience with God, a situation that lets us understand how much we really need God, that we start to understand the message. For some of us, it's not until everything else fails that we start to realize that God should have been our first resort rather than our last resort. And then sometimes some of us in the church just go through the motions of church and we don't realize that there is a living God that is active and relevant in the affairs of humanity. And, and, and it's not until you encounter an experience with God that you realize how lost you are without him. And when the preacher doesn't have that experience, he can't inspire faith in the people. Because you can't preach with conviction what you don't know yourself. And so that's why God had to allow the iron to sink. And that's why God sent Elisha to help this young preacher understand that God makes iron swim. Now this son of the prophet had a testimony. A testimony that might have stayed with him throughout his own ministry. A testimony that he serves the God that makes iron swim. And if iron can swim, what could sink you to the bottom that God cannot float to the top? And, and so this preacher had a testimony that he could share with somebody who's in discouragement. He had an experience that could uplift someone who had sunk down low. God makes iron swim. And God wants to make something in your life float. But the question is, will you ask him? When God puts you in a position of leadership, it's not about you. Amen. God has you in leadership so that you can share your testimony. Your testimony can empower somebody else to walk 
by faith. It's one thing to know that the Bible says that God makes iron swim. But it's another thing when you can testify that God has made to float the iron in your life. Some of us have some stuff that needs to be ironed out. And, and some of us need to stop playing church and start understanding relationship. That's why I want to tell our youth this morning that God does not set age limits on personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and so this means that iron can swim in your life too. And that means that when you're going through something, when, when you face life's challenges, you, when, when you're up against impossible odds, when your situation looks hopeless, God has the power to lift your burdens. Amen. God is not something we do only on Sabbath morning. Amen. Amen. God is present with you wherever you are. And he will manifest his glory if you only invite him into your situation. God is real. And some of us need to stop playing church and get real with God. Amen. Isaiah chapter 59, starting at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 59, starting at verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sometimes we don't have a testimony. We can't share an experience. We can't proclaim the message because sin burdens us down. Some of us know that we're doing stuff we have no business doing. But we serve a God who lifts burdens at Calvary. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1, starting at verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1, starting at verse 16. Isaiah 1, 16. The Bible says, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Is there somebody in the church this morning that needs to know that? Now, now shortly after this situation with the iron axe head, Syria warred against Israel. But the problem that Syria had was that every time they made plans to encamp at a particular location, hoping to surprise the enemy, their enemy seemed to know about it beforehand and avoid that place. It, 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 it happened so much that the king of Syria started to get concerned. He called a meeting with his servants, and he began to think that someone from within his own army must have been leaking information to the other side. There must have been a whistleblower warning the king of Israel. The Bible records in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 11, the Bible says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? But, it, but as it turns out, there was no one who had betrayed the king. God had sent word through Elisha and forewarned the king of Israel so that the Syrians could not catch him off guard. When the king of Syria heard about this, he encompassed the city where Elisha was with chariots and with horses and with soldiers. The situation looked so grim that one of Elisha's servants cried out, what are we going to do now? We're surrounded. They have us. We're in trouble. Isn't it often that when we do God's work, or when we do God's will, that the enemy seems to surround us and encompass us? The enemy sends discouragement and fear. The enemy makes it look like we're about to be overwhelmed. But as great as this army was, Elisha had a different perspective. Amen. 
Verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Sometimes we don't know the things that God protects us from. We don't always fully understand the provision that God has made for us because we don't see the whole picture. Sometimes we need our eyes open. And, and this was a lesson for the young man that just because your situation looks hopeless, just because your situation looks impossible, it doesn't mean that God hasn't given you the upper hand. God works out situations where the people with vision are usually the most blind. The young man who served Elisha walked away with a testimony. He served the God who encamps around his servants and does not let the enemy harm the apple of his eye. This young man had to learn that even when people are plotting against you, even when people have rallied forces that outnumber you, if God is with you, the enemy is outnumbered. Amen. Amen. Through the ministry of Elisha, for these young prophets, ministry was made practical. Elisha wasn't about drawing attention to himself. He was about inspiring faith in a community of preachers. Amen. Today, the church needs more humble people like Elisha. Amen. People willing to empower others to do God's work and share their testimony. Amen. God created humanity with freedom of choice. But if God had it his way, we would all be prophets. We would all share the testimony of Jesus. And some of us need a new experience with God. We need more testimony. And in order to have a testimony, we need to exercise more faith. Amen. You see, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So if we don't exercise faith, we won't see some of the things that God wants to do with us and some of the ways that God can deliver us. So we can't preach what we don't know. Righteousness comes by faith. And faith isn't faith unless it's put into practice. You see, practice is faith made practical. How many of us could be used in one way or another way if we weren't living in rebellion? Are there prophets here? Teachers or preachers? Church leaders or people who can give encouragement? Is there a Dorcas here or a Paul or a Peter? Amen. There are no age restrictions on God's power. This church can still be used in powerful ways. And some of us, what some of us might have thought was hopeless, if God could open our eyes so that we can see, what would we see? The world out there is trapped in darkness. In some problems and some situations that they can't fix. In some circumstances that no one can help them through. In a river under a weight that they can't lift alone. But you know a God, and I know a God, that can make iron swim. And I want to let you know this morning that you are empowered to preach the message. Go and tell these people in your community and at your job and in that classroom that you know a God that when things begin to sink in your life, God can make them swim. Amen. It's not about us. It's about the message. And sometimes we let us get in the way. God bless you. Amen.